I want to thank Barry for joining us today for this conversation. And, and all of you, uh, thanks for being here. We'll get to your questions in a little while. Um, I have some questions of my own, and, and we'll talk about some of Barry's previous work. We'll talk about a new film that he's working on that I'm really intrigued, intrigued by. Um, but just to sort of set the tone, um, uh, let me ask you, Barry, uh, why did you want to do this today? What, 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 why, what, what intrigued you about the opportunity to, uh, to sit down on a, on a nice uh, Saturday afternoon and, and chat with, with uh, well, that's filmmakers? Well, that's a good question. Writers. That's a good question. Um, I mean, I think it's fun to kind of share, or talk about, you know, uh, film or digital or, or just the world of, <coughs> of, of um, you know, film and storytelling. So it's great when something can work out and you can kind of just kind of sit and chat informally and talk about things or ask questions about stuff that I may have answers to or may not understand uh, the question. But, uh, you know, that uh, is part of, um, I think, the interaction of it all, which I enjoy. Well, we're going to get to, in a little while, we'll talk about this new film that you're involved with that I'm very curious about, or this new film that you've made. Um, but we were talking, um, I was intrigued by something, uh, by an exchange as we were about to head in here in the <coughs> green room. Um, we ended up uh, looking at looking at iPhones and, and comparing um, uh, iPhone photo programs, but it actually led to a comment that, I won't ask you to recreate the entire discussion, but it actually uh, intrigued me, this idea that, um, that the, the ability to uh, immediately create images on, on, a, on a device like an iPhone um, has, um, you seem to feel, in some way changed our relationship to cinema and, and the way we uh, perhaps um, see and experience images and films now um, has, well, clearly it's changed over, mm -hmm. over the past decades, but, but perhaps um, it's, in a, it's in a more precarious place now. And you, I wonder if you think that, that cinema as a, as, a, a, you know, as a concept is sort of gone in some way. Well, I mean, the conversation we were having, um, and I was, I, I'm not sure if I remember what I was going on about, but I, I was saying that there's, a, that there's an evolution to it all, because when I was a kid, I went to a movie theater, and there was a, an usher in a uniform, and uh, you went, and then they had a flashlight, and you're going to go sit down, and, and then there's going to be the show, and there's a giant red curtain, and then in, when, the, when the lights went down, completely into the real dark, then the red curtain parted uh, and there was another curtain. And then there, an image would begin behind the curtain and then that curtain would part and there was this movie screen and it was like magic almost. And it was, it was the, the anticipation and the excitement that there was now going to be a show. And nowadays, because you can get and watch anything you want, um, is where we are today, and we're not going back. But it's not exactly the same level of, of enthusiasm or excitement that you're going to see something. It is totally, because we all have it. So it's not about the magic of it anymore. And so we have it in our hands. We have the ability to tell the story. So that, therefore, that changes the relationship to the, the actual product from what was then almost beyond our understanding. Mm -hmm. How this thing happened, how these images got on the screen. We're all part of that now. We understand it. So it, is, it has devalued that and has now created uh, and evolved into uh, a, a different storytelling and a different process completely. So, so it's not only demystified, but it's, it's literally gotten to the point where anybody can do it with something that fits in the palm of their hand or yeah. in their pocket. But so if that's the case, then what, what keeps you intrigued? What keeps you interested? What keeps you motivated as a creative person to keep doing it? Well, because it's, um, you know, the magic was one element, but the, the ability to tell the story is, is something new. So in other words, you can tell a story in any particular format. Uh, so if that's the format you have is an iPhone, you can tell a story. If you have ideas, if you're excited about stuff, if you want to share it, you can say, look what I did. Look, take a look at that. You know, it might be a minute long, might be two minutes long. The length of it doesn't matter, but we can all tell stories now in a visual way. And so there's something quite fascinating about it. But, you know, uh, we're not going back to yesterday. I mean, that's what I, we got into this in a rather obscure way outside. But it's just a different sensibility so and the and because you can tell stories in so many different ways the storytelling uh, will also change it no longer has to be the the two-hour narrative it can be much more fragmented it can be 
and which you're beginning to see so many different ways of, uh, of how uh, stories are told. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let me, let me pick up on that in a, from a different vantage point and let me understand. Um, you talked about um, being a kid going to movie theater and being sort of entranced by the magic of that experience. Um, what was it? Uh, what was it? When did you become? When did you decide to become a filmmaker? Uh, what was it? Was it something about that magic that that intrigued you? Was there something else? Some well, other element of it? You know what it happens is, I mean, I didn't have. <coughs> you, you know, you have a background in writing and acting also, yeah. which we'll talk about. But my my first ambition, in a sense, was not to work in my father's appliance store. That that's where the, the very first thing. So I had no real positive thing that I wanted to do, and I ultimately in college. Um, got interested in uh, what was called in broadcast journalism. And tell us where you went to college. At something. American University. And so broadcast journalism, and then there was uh, a professor there who, who sort of took a, uh, you know, kind of became very supportive, and that led to me working at this television station as a floor director, and then as a floor director becoming an assistant director, and they were working on news programs, and that led to all the things within the building about you know ultimately doing little on-air commercials and cutting things together of which I did on my own and one of the influential and this sounds because I didn't have a real um, film school background but one of the jobs as an assistant director uh, was to roll the, the commercial breaks into the late show and the late late show and so you know at 11:30 would begin you know the movies that's the way it would be on this uh, channel 9 in Washington DC and so I started seeing all of these films, older films, of which I knew nothing about. In other words, I never heard of Citizen Kane. You know, I had no knowledge of it. I just saw it on The Late Show. And I remember talking to guys at the diner. I said, you know, did you see this thing, this Citizen Kane? And I'm trying to explain the movie. And then I saw the, everything from like, you know, Touch of Evil. And then I began to see some of these older um, John Ford movies in The Grapes of Wrath. And I began to, every because every night there was two shows, and I, for about, seven months I ro rolled the commercial breaks into all of these old movies and I began to like be really quite taken by it but not thinking about one day I'd like to write and one day I would like to direct mm -hmm. um, I was just fascinated by it and then eventually I came to Los Angeles mm -hmm. and uh, long story to get to that I, I got involved in an acting school not that I wanted to act but for two years I spent seven days a week there you know doing various things and improv work and that uh, that led to doing improvs and doing stand-up comedy, and then I began to realize I could actually, not just improv it, if I think about the character, I could write it on a, on a piece of paper and not have to get up and do it. Mm -hmm. And that, that led to writing. Yeah. And, and you, broke <laughs> you broke into writing in television, is that correct? Yeah, yes. Uh, how did that come about? What was that experience like? Well, um, it, it was, you know, be, uh, Craig Nelson, who's an actor, you may have seen him, he was in Coach and whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, the two of us were in acting school together, and one of the things we used to do were these improvs. And we would do improvs together, and we used to get some laughs, and we made up stuff. And then that led to uh, saying, I wonder if we can put together some material and play local clubs, mm -hmm. and which we did. And Penny Marshall, who was new to L.A. then, s I, I got to know a little bit. And she said, you know, there's a new show starting, local show and you know you guys would be perfect for that and I got a job it was a 90 minute show uh, in Los Angeles basically live on tape and we became writers on the show and we became performers on the show and every week you had to come up with new material and we some sketches would work and some would really really bomb I mean just terrible but out of that process you began to see things like, oh, look what happens if you do this, and what happens if you do that, and, and that was the beginning of beginning to understand it, mm -hmm. and, and how, it could, how it worked, and so we, it was a year that we did the show before it, uh, it got canceled, and that was a very informative period, because we literally would try, we came in on a Monday, if you can picture this, show was 90 minutes long, we came in on a Monday morning, we had to come up with 90 minutes of material by Friday, yeah. and there were four writers. And that's what we did. So you can imagine how bad some of the material was. <laughs> and that was the beginning of one year of constantly doing things and performing and beginning to see how things work and didn't work. And you, and you wrote for Mel Brooks. How did that um, relationship come about? Um, uh, it grew out of this in some It fashion? grew out of, well, I mean, there's a bunch of little things in between. I, the, Carol Burnett show. Well, I, Marty Feldman was one of the, the first things I did in England as a, as a writer and Larry Gelbart was the, the producer and the writer of the show. 
And then from that, it led to some, um, uh, a couple failed TV shows. And then, um, it, then it led to Carol Burnett, which was the first sort of legitimate you know, successful show that we had worked on. Anybody ever seen the Carol Burnett show? It was one of my favorites as a kid. Yeah. Okay, making sure it still has resonance because yeah. I, I just think that show's amazing. Well, what was great about it is because as opposed to a lot of variety shows of the time, people used to just read the cue cards. And we used to write the material that you really had to perform it. And, and Carol and that, in, oh, that entire group of Harvey Corman and Tim Conway, they didn't read the cue cards. They really learned the sketches and then they worked and they would do a little bit of fooling around within it. And that was a great period because they really worked the material. It wasn't like, a, oh, what did you, you know, sketch. It was really worked on and evolved. And so we did that for three years. Mm -hmm. And during that period of time, uh, we got involved with Mel Brooks uh, through a, a producer that we had done a failed show with, whose name was Ron Clark. And that led to us, you know, doing a few movies with Mel Brooks. Um, let me ask you about... Uh, a screenwriter working with actors, and then I want to ask you, I want to go back and ask you a bit about acting as well. Um, on a show like The Carol Burnett Show, I, I, as, a, as a viewer, it seemed to me that there were, that there were moments that were, that were beginning from a screenplay, but evolving into something that had improv improvisational elements, or maybe a lot of improv, improv I'm not sure. Um, and, and if, A, was that, how much improv was there on, on, uh, uh, on the Very show little. Like okay. Very, very little. Um, Tim Conway would would probably play around the most because he sometimes he would know there was a physical piece of business and he knew and he'd come sometimes he, he'd walk onto the set and he he'd check how strong the door is because he was going to do some extra little thing here uh -huh. and so Tim would play around with some material mm -hmm. but Harvey and uh, Vicki Lawrence and uh, and Carl Burnett it was almost really word for word mm. there might be some little thing that happens but they they were really you know married to that material Interesting, because I was going to ask you how a, how a writer sort of interacts in an environment like that. But it sounds like you're, uh, you did, it's not something you had to uh, to deal with as a as a writer. And sort no, of I mean we see we knew Tim, and so we used to write a lot of the the physical comedy sketches, and he used to do this old man who would sort of <laughs> shuffle along, you know. And we wrote a lot of those, yeah. a lot of those kinds of. What pieces. was that character's name? Does anybody remember the name of that character? I can't remember, I can't but either. he did this old guy, and it took forever <laughs> to react to anything, you know. There were. And, and it was, once you got a setup for it, you knew that it, you know, it could work. So we had him as a, a cab driver one time, and Harvey Corman jumps in the cab and says, "Take me to the airport and make it and make it snappy." And they're just like 15 seconds, and then all of a sudden, like Tim looks into the mirror and goes, "A passenger." <laughs> you know, he said, "To the airport. I got to go to the airport." And he pulls out the Thomas Guide and goes, "Airport A." AI, <laughs> AI. He said, "But just get me." Th and and the the big physical thing that Tim did, and knowing that is that when they used to have the flag that used to lower on a on a cab, yeah. he had to push it down. He couldn't push it down. <laughs> he literally had his whole body up on the dashboard trying to push it down. So we would write those kinds of things, very physical stuff. What year, what year was that show? Do you remember? We well, it went for eleven years, and we did three of the years. We did. Um, I think 74, 75, 76. Yeah. Uh, I'm just or something like that. Sitting here remembering that show, and it was a, yeah. I was a kid then, and it was I just died to watch that show. It was every a week. great it was experience. Was it was a great, 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 great experience, and you know, there's you always wonder if you're going to sort of survive the show because we only had we were signed to do six episodes uh -huh. originally to see if we're going to be you know if we can cut it you know yeah. because we were considered really kind of crazy writers then so the idea of doing something like Carol Burnett was like can can these guys pull that off and so for the first five episodes we did not have a piece of material we went oh my god I mean we're just out the door and then the the sixth episode we had three sketches yeah. and then I'll never forget you're waiting to see if you're going to get a laugh and all of a sudden there was this huge laugh and it was like okay <laughs> we've survived and we'll be and then we did three years from that so, so let me switch gears. I said I was yeah. going to mention um, acting, and I wonder what you, how you look at that now. And for folks that might be filmmakers or writers in the audience, I'm sure many of them, if not all, uh, how important is it to have that acting training, that acting background? Is it, is it for everyone? Uh, it obviously helped you considerably. Well, it did, for, it did for me because I didn't have any kind of, um, you know, I didn't have any training at all in terms of 
how you write screenplays, how you do anything, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, it became one of, uh, of evolving. So if you're in the acting school and then you're doing scenes, that's one thing. And if you're doing improvs, and then from that you have to make up stuff. Mm -hmm. But you have to make it up with in terms of the character. And so for me, writing evolved from character. So you, 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 you have to think the character. You just can't think of a line. You have to think in terms of the character. And if you really get in, into it, the character will say things that you did not expect. So if I'm really connected, I'm literally writing things that I'm going, oh, that's interesting. Like I didn't think of it. You know, as if, well, the character thought of it, not me. And so you have to think in terms of character to write the dialogue. Because then it becomes less predictable. Because then it will be as if it's all made up. You know, in fact, I'll never forget, you know, my father saying to me when I, uh, when I did Diner, and he says, you know, we saw the movie, you know, it's, I, th I thought you, you, know, you, you wrote that. I said, no, I, I, I did. It's what sounds like it's all made up. That's not writing. And so to him, <laughs> it wasn't writing because was, he was used to, you know, the other things. So for me, it was to make the, the inarticulate, which was the characters I was trying to deal with in Diner, the inarticulate nature of it was, was very important to it. And if you connect to the character, then you begin to hear them talk, and then you just simply write. Mm -hmm. So for me, acting was extremely important because you understand character, and then character evolves into what is being said. And then, of course, you have to find some kind of structure uh, that will evolve. But this, to me, structure had evolved through character, mm -hmm. not Im impose the structure on the characters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that, to me, is invaluable. Of course, it's very, very important in terms of being a director. But um, that to me, those steps of interacting with other people, playing characters, when then you realize, okay, I don't have to actually do it. Now I can think it in my mind. I can, I, I'll play this character, I'll play that character. Mm -hmm. And now I'm this character, now I'm that character. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the way I, I, I write. Do you have an even more specific writing process, uh, sort of a way that you work as a writer, uh, writing in a certain place, in a certain Time of day, morning. No, day, I generally it? would write from say ten o'clock until six. I would generally play music all the time. Um, it, it, it's funny you, when I when I write something now because if I, you do iTunes, you can play the same song over and over again, and it'll tell you the count how many times you've listened to it. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So when I first started, you had to put the record on and play it, <laughs> and then back up. So I realized one of, the, one of the last things that I wrote that I had played one song 187 times. So I'll lock into a song that for some reason, it's not like what's being said in the song, but there's an energy in it that applies to what I'm playing with. Can you tell us what that song was? Well, I mean, in all the movies, it's different. If I, I do remember uh, in, in a Diner, I, I played, uh, Pete Townsend had written an album called Empty Glass, and there was a, a song called uh, Rough Boys. Mm -hmm. or, rough Boys or Tough Boys? I can't remember that now. Tough boys are rough boys. And I played that song over and over again. I don't know why. There was a, something about it that I connected to. So mm -hmm. I, I will like play music constantly. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I generally will write from the beginning to the end. I don't know how to outline. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know how to do that. Because I, if I had to write an outline, I think I'd still be working on the outline even for Diner. <laughs> I don't understand how to do that. But I, but I do see the, the, the movie sort of evolve, but I can't take that outline stage. My, my mind doesn't work very well that way. Diner was clearly a, um, a, a career turning point, I'd probably safe to say, for you. Um, well, in one movie, I think I, I experienced everything you face in the business because I, I made the movie. Uh, the studio really didn't like it at all. It, it came out in only a, a few cities. This is it, 1982. Yeah. It was pulled so. from release. It was never to be seen again. It was put on a shelf. It was a disaster. So it was like, okay, you're, you're finished. That's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And then literally all of a sudden in six weeks, it suddenly got resurrected and opened in New York, and it got mm -hmm. these rave reviews, and all of a sudden, then you go, oh. So you went from one extreme to the other, and it's the same movie mm -hmm. in, a, in a, a, a six, seven-week period. I mean, how it happened is a strange thing unto itself but you you can see how sometimes perception is in this case the studio literally would you you would have thought the film was in another language they were that that uh, bothered by the movie uh -huh. at, at which i never did understand but it went from we, we hate it to all of a sudden it got celebrated so one movie 
And how are, how are you, this might be an interesting, um, your response to this question might be interesting for those in the audience, and I'm wondering how you sort of processed that six week, two month period, um, finishing something, getting that feedback that was negative, hitting a bottom, hitting a low point, clearly, and then having this project kind of you know, resurrect. H how did you get, how did you deal with that? I don't want to say get through it, but how did you, how did you work well, through it? Well, a lot it? of it is sort of a blank, but you know, because you, you, keep, you, know, you keep thinking about the movie in your head, and you go, I don't understand, I don't understand. Why, why, would they, why is it so disliked? I, don't, I did not understand, I mean, I, I kept thinking, I don't know, I mean, it, it looks, I, it sounds like what I thought. I, don't, I, I literally could not process what the resistance was. Mm -hmm. And so when it was pulled out of release, um, you know, it was like never to be seen. And then when it opened on the f at, at the, the festival on 56th Street, and, uh, and I'll never forget this, on, the, on um, its, um, its first night, it had a very good, you know, group showed up, had these incredible reviews. And I remember this kind of moment. Um, I was working, oddly enough, w on the, the, the last of the rewrite of Tootsie, and, and Sidney Pollack was uh, in his, this apartment which was right around the corner from 57th Street, and there was this blinding rain, and I'm, I'm looking out to 57th Street to see if anybody is in line for the movie on a Saturday night, and, and Sidney Pollack was a terrific guy, and he said, you know, they'll, they'll come, they'll stand in the cold, they'll stand in it, but you know, they don't like the rain. <laughs> and, and I'm looking, and then I had to go meet uh, Mark Johnson, who was a producer, and we kind of started this whole thing together, and I got into a cab and I was gonna go meet him for dinner and I go by the 57th Street and there's nobody outside. It's an eight o'clock show and we're literally going by it and I'm going, Jesus, there's nobody there, there's no one there. And I get to meet him f for dinner and he said, just stop by the festival. And I went, no, no, I didn't, uh, I, was a <laughs> I was busy. And, and so he said, um, sold out. I said, really? He said, yeah, it was raining, you know, they let everybody in and there's a downstairs. And all of a sudden it was like, sold out? It sold out? And then it, it broke the house record a week later. And so, you know, you go through, and, and that's part of the business in a sense, because the other component is we can, you can talk about writing and you can talk about this and you can talk about editing and everything else and all of his aspects. And then there is a pure emotional aspect of the business. That one moment it, you're euphoric, euphoric and another moment you feel like, you know, it's, it's the end and then it's highs and lows, and you have to learn how to deal with it. It's just part of the business. You know, Mel Brooks has a great uh, example. He says, you go to see your movie in a preview, and he says, you got like a barometer, and you sit in the back, and you listen to the audience, and you listen to the response, and you're going, good, good, I'm out of the business. Good, <laughs> good, I'm out of the business. <laughs> and yeah, so you sort of feel. It's just that you, you, that's just part of what you do because you put yourself on the line and some people are going to like what you do and some people don't and sometimes it's overwhelmingly positive and sometimes it's overwhelmingly negative and it's just part of it yeah. and uh, that's the way it is. Well, I mean, we could, you know, we could, we could talk about um, Avalon, Rain Man, The Natural, Bugsy, Good Morning Vietnam, we could talk about homicide. Uh, you know, I want to give people a chance to ask questions shortly. I want to skip way ahead <laughs> before we go backwards again, um, because I want to talk about a new project that you're working on that you're just finishing or just about finished. Mm -hmm. Just about. Um, I'm fascinated by, um, it's called The Bay. The Bay. It started as a documentary. Maybe you can set this up for us, and I want to ask you some questions about how it was made and why. Okay. But, but um, what happened is, I mean, I'm from Baltimore, and so obviously, you know, um, I had this affection for the place that I grew up. And in, in, um, I saw this documentary, um, Frontline did a documentary about the Chesapeake Bay, and he said 40% of it is dead, dead, completely dead. There's flesh-eating bacteria, there's so-and-so, and I'm going, I'm watching it, I'm going, oh my God, this is a horrific. And nobody talks about it, nobody seems bothered. You know, I don't think anybody watched the documentary, really. And it's like, okay, that's life, 40% dead, okay. And so I, I happened to be in, in Baltimore speaking to some group, and I was talking. I, it came up out of some question that was asked, and I said, it's 40% dead. You would figure people would be in a panic. And I said, you know, it, there's so much clutter out there, you almost have to really do something to get in someone's face for us to pay attention nowadays, unfortunately. And so afterwards, it was like a throwaway comment. 
afterwards, some woman approached me and said, would you do a documentary about the Chesapeake Bay, you know, talking about, you know, the, how you would address it, et cetera. And I said, oh, okay, all right. And so I'll do that. And then I had two meetings, and I realized this isn't going to work. I mean, I don't, it's fine to do a documentary and, you know, do it for free, but I don't know that I need to have that kind of meddling and why do we have to do this? Uh, well, you know, how about if you did that? You know, I'm going, no, it's not, it's not worth it. It's too, it's, it just doesn't do it. So I was talking to my uh, assistant, uh, Jason, about, I said, you know, if you took everything that the documentary would have and if you tweaked it a little bit, you could end up with a theatrical movie that would really be frightening, that would really scare you to death based on 90% of science and, you know, 10% of just some kind of, you know, imagination that would evolve from these elements. And so we got a writer and talked it down, put it together, and then ultimately set it up, did it very inexpensively, did it for, you know, about $2 million, shot it in 18 days, uh, basically a cast of unknowns, shot it on all digital, everything from uh, no real, we didn't even go to the red. We couldn't even really afford to use a red camera of that. So we literally used much, um, uh, you know, n not the, 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 the digital stuff that's not even as good, all the way down to an iPhones, to every kind of, you know, consumer t uh, product available. And we basically put the piece together, and it shot on the water, underwater, you know, um, during uh, all type of things. And it was built out of that, which is basically a, a mock documentary based on all the things I would have done in the documentary. So it's 4th of July, Chesapeake Bay, and And an ecological disaster based on the science of, of the bay. And, and so that's how it evolved into it. Because I, I would not say, gee, I'd like to do a scary movie. Right, you know, right. I can enjoy them, but I wouldn't think to, to work on something like that. But because it evolved from a documentary, yeah. um, so it, it, it led to what this piece is. And, and using the different formats, you said iPhones and other cameras, um, that's because it's seen from the vantage point of people who are experiencing it's, it, this, yes, it's this all catastrophe or this It's all disaster. basically based on uh, collected, you know, uh, collected data. Uh -huh. So there were people who had cameras that were out on boats. There were people who were walking around, you know, at, at, the, at, the, at the, you know, July 4th party, people who were swimming, people were doing this, and um, Skype, you know, conversations that were going on between the CDC, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it's all this kind of uh, digital data that was collected and the documentary got put together from that. Mm -hmm. And that's basically the, the design for it. Mm -hmm. So it has a very kind of naturalistic thing of which we try to chronicle what took place and how this ecological um, episode unfolded. So I just rattled off all of these uh, films that probably most of us in this room have seen that you've been involved with. And yet, um, Barry Levinson's making a $2 million independent film on you know, iPhones and yeah. small cameras. Um, but that was a great fun. I mean, it was Tell great fun. Tell me about fun. why that, uh, well, let me hear more about that. I mean, one is, I mean, I, I, I used a, you know, a, a real cast of unknowns and also you know, people, because we shot in South Carolina, so we had a lot of day players, and some of the day players evolved into you know, more than day players, and we built up the, you know, their parts from doing improv stuff, mm -hmm. et, et cetera. Um, but it's, it's part of this new language. So the idea of being able to take these various little, very compact little digital cameras and, uh, and film sequences that apply to the work. And then, of course, you can write to that as well, because you do have to write in a little bit different fashion if it's going to be that informal. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, it, was, it was a real challenge, and it was a lot of fun. I mean, there was no... Um, you know, we were this little teeny, you know, unit with a lot of, you know, young people running around with these little cameras, and we would collect the cameras. We would give sometimes the cameras to the people who were in the streets and just let them shoot stuff and then collect the cameras and download the data, and then we would literally put it together that way. So you, you, it was sort of a, you have to allow it to be free enough that things are going to happen, and hopefully within it you're going to get the type of things you want. And so it's a little bit of a gamble at times in terms of what somebody actually did in a, in a, in a scene that had a certain amount of uh, chaos to it and, uh, and see what comes from it. So that, that, to me, was great fun to play that way. What, what were some things about that process that either surprised you or that you, you might have learned from that? I mean, you've obviously worked on the opposite end of that spectrum and with, you know, with 
well-known actors, uh, substantial budget, um, big cameras, real, you know, camera rigs and stuff. Well, but, you know, part of it is, in a sense, it's, you know, you, you don't necessarily know, at least in my life, I don't really know where I'm going or what I'm going to do or I have no plan. Okay. Uh, I had been for the last few years mixed in with uh, some theatrical things. I've been doing some um, little documentaries. You know, I did a thing called Pollywood mm -hmm. about celebrity and the media. You and went the, to the Democratic Convention. Yeah, and the intersection of all of that. I did a little documentary for ESPN called The Band That Wouldn't Die. And so, the, those, so by playing with a few of those documentaries recently uh, and then taking it forward to a, a mock documentary mm -hmm. and also knowing enough in terms of uh, improvisational stuff, you just keep bringing those elements forward. So, for instance, we had a day player, and there's a young girl, she's 15, and she had a little scene with, a, with an iPhone. And she's supposedly to show that she's breaking out in blisters talking to her friend. Mm -hmm. So all she really needs to say is, you know, you know look at this. You know, right? And then she shows these blisters. And when I was talking to her, I thought that she was interesting. There was something about her that was fascinating. So I said, um, do me a favor. You know, show the blisters and just talk to your friend. And, here, and I'd laid out the things that you can talk about, and this is what's going on, and then because there is no playback, you can't see what's going on, uh, literally send her into a, into a bathroom, and we're kind of on the other side of the wall, and I'm just trying to you know, listen to hear what she's talking about, and I left her in there, and she just went on for about three minutes talking about things, mm -hmm. and then I, I looked at what she did and how she shot it, and I thought, well, she's really interesting, and I said, it'd be nice to have her in another scene with the iPhone and another at now at the hospital because she had to go there. And then I, I and but the interesting thing is I said, look, I'd like to do, use you another day. And she said, oh, I said, well, what's wrong? She says, you know, I, I got to have to get out of school. You know, can you write a note? <laughs> <laughs> and then she did that scene. I thought, well, that was really good. Maybe I'll do another scene with her. I put her here. So, I mean, she was literally a, a day player. And then she evolved and she's, you know, a character in the movie. So. Yeah. You know, that may or may not work, but, you know, that's part of the playing loose and free and see what happens. Yeah. I mean, that's part of the enthusiasm of it all. I mean, that's why, you know, you, I, I don't get bored because you're, you challenge yourself sometimes into a place that you're not sure that you can make it work. But that's also part of the, the fun of it. And that's what's interesting about all this new technology because there are so many options available. The question is, can you make it cohesive. Yeah. Can, you, can you still, no matter what you're doing, you've got to tell the story. You have to engage the people, but everything else, you know, in terms of the hardware or, or the software, whatever you want to call it, you know, is, uh, is what it is. And you still feel that sense of anxiousness, so to speak, of, you know, bringing something to an audience for the first time? Uh, is it, is it still Absolutely. something that you... No, it's always, you know, look, you just never know. I mean, you don't know. I mean, you are playing with an unknown. I mean, I guess if you stay in a certain genre... You know, it, I guess it's a, it's a little more simple because you go, okay, I got this, and well, that may not work, but I got that big chase sequence, mm -hmm. that that'll hold it for a while, mm -hmm. you know. But when you don't have that to go to, sometimes it's a, and you don't have a genre which immediately tells an audience what it is. It's a little, that's why, and and when I think back to that's that was the problem of Diner initially because it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't some kind of you know, young guys you know, goofball comedy. It, it, it didn't fit what was out there. So uh -huh. therefore, it wasn't easy to sell. Uh -huh. And that's probably one of the reasons that I had that resistance initially. Well, and, and let me ask you, how does, how does Hollywood react to that then? How does, how does the West Coast or how does, uh, you know, the industry, so to speak, react to you now seeing the kinds of things you've been doing the last few years? And given your, your tremendous track record in film and television, how do you interact with the industry differently, if at all? I, I mean, I don't interact with them that often in that regard. I mean, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't deal with that part. I, they're just things you want to try and get made, and you try to get them made. You know, I don't spend... It's one of the reasons why I don't live in Los Angeles, is that it, there's too much time talking uh, about the business. Mm -hmm. And so there's not enough time to just think of what's going on in life and what interests you and what kind of story can you tell? So I, I can't give you a good answer for that. At the period when, uh, I'm trying to understand sort of the trajectory here for, for those who might be um, uh, embarking on or in the middle of a similar kind of experience. And, and, um, and in your case, at, at someone, say at the point when, when Rain Man was you know, the Oscar winner, um, I imagine that 
that your career could have taken any number of different tracks and you had to to really think about where you wanted to go from there. Well, I see, I didn't, again, I mean. Uh, you, but you, you said earlier you don't plan these things. No, I didn't, I didn't plan. I mean, look, I didn't think that, I didn't think that Rain Man was really gonna be that successful. Right. God knows the studio didn't think it was gonna be successful at all. Um, and it just caught on, you know, it was one of those weird things that just suddenly, I mean, you have to understand, I mean, you, you, you all probably know if on, on an opening weekend, you know, so if a movie can do 13 or 14 million, it's like, well, it's okay. Um, if it does 30 million, oh, okay, you know, it could do 150. Um, the opening weekend gross of, of Rain Man was $6 million um, at that time, and it still did 175 million domestically. So what happens is it just hung in there, and it just started growing and growing and growing. So to say that you would say, okay, yeah, this is a movie that'll do a, a, about a, a half a billion dollars that costs 25 million, um, you would never even imagine it. And, and so I, I, it wasn't like, here's a plan for success. You just did the movie because it seemed interesting. Um, and then after that, I wanted to go back and do another Baltimore story. So I went back and did um, you know, Avalon, rather than let me do something else that's supposed to be equally successful. So I've never kind of functioned in the way of like, how do I maintain that level of success as opposed to, uh, well, this seems interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, this is interesting. It's something, it has to be something interesting enough that you're going to spend a year of your life because right. that's what happens every time. Well, and, and, and even <coughs> picking up on that, and even though we wouldn't think of you as an L.A. guy, um, let me ask you one more question about that aspect of it and then we'll get questions from the audience. Um, we're at a moment where, so the Oscars are last weekend, and 2011 with, with films like The King's Speech and The Social Network and Black Swan, or 2007 with films like No Country for Old Men or There Will Be, there Will Be Blood, there's been, there's been so much talk about how a certain kind of film um, uh, has, been, has been celebrated in a way, you know, it, and I'm not gonna use the word independent, but, but films that are coming from a more um, uh, director-driven uh, place um, are, are, are finding more success at, at certain moments. Um, how do you contextualize that, this moment for us, from your vantage point? Um, well, I mean, I think what you're seeing is in, it's still the early days of this, um, this divide, which I think will become greater, that you'll have the studio movies, which will be these kind of real big pieces, basically, or, you know, uh, very genre-oriented, you know, teen comedy thing, this, you know, the, the tent poles or whatever mm -hmm. they may be, and then you'll see this other group where you have the King's Speech of those, and then there will be the, the third, which are these uh, more independent and cheaper you know, films. So you'll, I think you'll see three divisions mm -hmm. there, and then you will see more and more internet um, influence, okay. which will be another track completely okay. that won't even be connected to so-called theatrical, because the, the theatrical, in a sense, is, a, is kind of a strange thing, because I was talking to somebody, I said, you know, what is the difference between um, theatrical and something that's basically seen on, um, you know, television. It's, it's basically a, a three-month window, mm -hmm. period. So for three months, it's out there, and then for the rest of its life, it's going to be seen on television or on your iPhone or on your anything else, right? So there's only that little teeny window, and that window is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So you say, well, what is the difference between theatrical and what, whatever else? It's, it's going to disappear. Yeah. I mean, because if I was telling you, where did I see uh, Citizen Kane? I saw it on television. Yeah. Where did I see Casablanca? I saw it on television. I never went to a movie theater to see those. It was before my time. So most of the movies I saw that are classics are from television. Most of our knowledge about all of these films came from television. So this, the conceit about theatrical is right now a three-month window and it's getting shorter and shorter. Mm -hmm. And at a certain time in the future, you will go to the movies and you'll see something because it'll be some event, uh, a large, big thing, and everything else is going to be running in multiple different platforms, whether you're, you're downloading it onto your computer or, or, or kicking it up onto your TV screen or whatever. We're going to see what we want, when we want it, and, there, and the distinction of what it is will matter less. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's where, the, where it goes in the future. Right. And it may be something that's 11 minutes long, or it may be something that's six and a half hours long. I don't think you know, that, that distinction is all based on the way theatrical used to be. When you have a show at 8, show at 10, 
right? So here you say, all right, what well, it was 11 minutes, and you may get as much of a buzz with an 11 minute piece as you will with the uh, two hour movie or the six hour movie. Maybe we could install some of those red curtains in our home. In the that. little teeny iPhone, it opens yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's take some questions from the audience. This has been a really terrific discussion. I want to thank you for taking the time. Oh, today. no, it's been fun. So let's it's been fun. So we, do, we have a microphone right here. Hi. Hi, my name is Nancy, and I had a question about um, your writing in terms of it, do you find that you approach comedy versus drama differently, or how are they, the, how, how do you approach them in terms of similarities and differences between writing for different genres? Well, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I don't know that I, I specifically, I mean, if you wanted to do one and the other, and, there's, and, it's, and it's, I don't know how to write a joke, for one. I could still be working on a joke of any, anything I've ever done because I don't know how to write a joke. I only know how to work it through a character. So as an, as an example, um, and I learned this in an improv, and it occurred to me, I went, well, that's interesting. Uh, you know, in improvs, they would say, here's the, um, the premise is that you and your wife, uh, she's leaving you, and you secretly actually want her to leave. That's the premise, okay? So you got to do an improv. So the improv is doing, and she's, she's packing her bags to leave, and the dialogue is, you know, honey, I really don't want you to go, you know, maybe we can work this out, right? This very straight kind of dialogue, you know? But... In the improv, I was helping her pack. <laughs> and, and that, in a sense, is sort of the distinction between the drama and the comedy. So if you're folding the sweater and you're putting it in there, say, but can't we work this out? There must be a way. And just going into the bureau and getting something else and putting it in there, because I just don't know how I'm going to live without you, and going around and get some shoes and put it into the thing. Now you have something that became comedy, but it's not based on a joke. It was based on the character in that particular situation. So that's how I would make a distinction between one and the other. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go. Um, there's a woman in the sixth row, I think. Yes, with the glasses. Hello. And we'll get you, we'll get you a microphone. And then we'll come around. Hi, Hi. Thanks for sharing all of this with us. My name is Amy Hart, and I've made a film on global water issues. So I'm thrilled to hear about the Bay. I actually saw the documentary and was shocked by it. So I'd love to hear about your distribution plans for your film. Well, the people who, uh, who invested in it um, were the same group that ultimately picked up you know, Paranormal and they have a few other things. So um, the, what they do first off is that they sold off you know, foreign territories and then uh, we're getting close to when we're going to go for uh, a, you know, a domestic distribution. And so uh, you know, because the cost is so, you know, so low, they're basically able to just by selling off parts of it you know, put themselves into a profit, and then the question is, where does it go in terms of distribution, which will be the next step of that. Uh, let's see, where are the microphones? So we have a microphone over here. Yes, on the, th right here. Hi. Hi. Um, one of my absolute favorite movies of yours is Liberty Heights, and the performances you oh, got. Oh, thank you. You got from those two wonderful young actors. I wondered if you had any plans in the future to work again with very young, I know they were, what, 18, 19? Uh, to work with very young actors and tell kind of a teenage story again? Well, I don't know. I mean, I certainly, I mean, even in, I mean, in the Bay, there are a lot of very young actors in the, in the Bay. Um, some have had little experience or no experience. Um, it depends on the project. I mean, it's great. I mean, I, Ben Foster, um, you know, sometimes I may see four or 500 people for a given role, and Ben Foster was the only person I saw for that character in Liberty Heights. Um, and so it all depends. It's great sometimes when you, when you see a young talent and you think this person has such potential. It, you know, uh, it's wonderful. But it depends what comes along because sometimes you really want an unknown and sometimes you know, uh, somebody that's more established is because you're dealing with sometimes age that they've already you know, uh, found their level of success. Okay, we'll go to the gentleman over here holding the microphone. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, my name is Matthew and I'm a writer and I was just wondering if you could speak uh, about your development process and um, like with the Bay, you said you had the idea and then you found the writer and uh, I know you have a number of other projects that you're working on as well, the um, Phil Spector thing and the Larry McMurtry and Bill Bryson and stuff and just uh, your development process, how you choose projects and, and shepherd them through. 
Well, I don't know. Um, you know, what happens is um, there are various things that you're sort of interested in, and some things don't really progress, you know, because it's not – you're fighting the issue of, of money, you know, and whether you're going to have the financing for it, um, whether you can get the right actors for a piece. So some things stall and stay, you know, stalled for a, a while. Uh, but there are these various things that come along that you, you know, that you work on, and then sometimes they – you know, they come forward, and some of them we just cannot get them out of uh, uh, out of gear. I mean, like in the past, uh, uh, you know, through my company, we did you know Donnie Brasco, which took I don't know three four years to get that thing you know finally uh, to come forward. It just you know things get you know stalled. Same thing with Quiz Show. Um, some things happen fast, and a lot of things take a lot of time for a lot of different reasons. Okay, let's uh, gentlemen with the red. Sweatshirt or shirt? Hoodie? Hi. Um, hi. Um, I just, I guess I have two questions, but they kind of go hand in hand. When it comes to dealing with actors, um, do you have any suggestions as far as, um, you know, how you pull such great performances from them? You know, because one, one of my favorite films of yours is Good Morning Vietnam, and uh, Robin Williams is known as this manic, funny guy, but you pulled such a performance out of him that, yeah, he makes you laugh, but then at the drop of a dime, he, he breaks your heart in that film. And um, I guess the second part of my question is, how much time um, do you leave that up to the editor, or are you in the editing room with the editor also saying, well, you know what, I kind of like this shot better, or like, um, I don't know, how would you go about dealing with actors and if it spills over into the editing room? Well, I mean, um, how, you know, it's a good question about how you work with an actor because I'm not exactly sure um, how. Uh, all actors, you know, function in a different way and you have to kind of begin to figure out uh, what that's about. I think I think because I, were, I, I studied theater for two years or in acting school for two years was very influential because you began to understand if they're having a problem, how do you get past that moment? Otherwise, you can just be sitting and you know, spinning your wheels and, and the clock is ticking. You have to figure out how to accomplish whatever the issue is that comes up. So if I were to say, um, um, let's use Rain Man as an example. In the movie, uh, one of the earliest scenes we're going to do, and uh, they're, in a, they're in a kind of a restaurant having breakfast or something, and Tom Cruise is there, and Dustin is at the table. And I said to uh, Dustin, I said, the character, he looks very uh, depressed to me. And, you know, the, you know an autistic person doesn't have that. They're not, they don't, they don't, they're not, like, depressed or what. They're busy. They're very busy. I mean, they would be, they, they're looking at the lights, how many lights. They're calculating, how, you know, the lights, the thing, the whatever, the how many tiles. I mean, they're very busy. There's a, there's a mind that's working. And he said, all right, that's very good. So now we go to do a take, and Tom's talking to him, and he's, he's looking, 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 and there's no answer. There's no answer. And I, you know, said, all right, cut. I said, Dustin, you know, not answer. He said, well, I got so involved in the lights, <laughs> I didn't see, I didn't hear him. I didn't hear him. I said, well, you got to, we can't have you just drifting off forever. And he said, but I don't know how. I said, well, you hear them, but you're not, you don't pay attention to them, but you hear them, you know? So, and, and if you ever watch the movie, he'll say, um, um, Ray, do you want to do so-and-so? Yeah. You want to do it? Yeah. You want to do the thing, Ray? Yeah. And then, so he's like, he's connected. He hears it, but he's busy. Yeah, yeah. You were there? Yeah. And, but once he realizes what it is, he may not do it. Because he never paid attention. It was like he's going to go on an airplane, uh, or he's in the airport, but he's not thinking airplane until he sees an airplane. So that's when all of a sudden he goes, no, 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 no. But, you know, all, all that stuff is yeah, yeah. So that's how he was tethered to the, to the scene. Just a simple thing of yeah. And that kept him involved, and that kept him, he could be busy with anything. So go, Ray, Ray, yeah, yeah. And that little teeny thing got him past the idea of being depressed or being active, being active, but still being connected to what the character is talking about. So it can be as simple as that, and you have to get, you have to figure out between what's hanging up an actor and, and 
and, and what can you adjust? Well, we are unfortunately going to have to leave them wanting more because I, w we could talk about any number of your films um, and, uh, for, for a while, but we're out of time. Yeah. So uh, I want to thank Barry Levinson for, for being here, and I want to thank you, audience. Thank you very much. Thanks.